Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Reading these books by King Solomon will continuously remind you just how obvious wisdom is, as literature, yet difficult in practice. Take for example this saying from Proverbs. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. That's Proverbs 26 verses 4 to 5. In reading, it is easy to understand the proverb. It's knowing when to play dumb and when not to, with an idiot, so as not to be, the idiot. But to successfully practice this can be extremely treacherous if not done wisely. What is required in this proverb but not explicitly implied is excellent discretion. In other words, one can act upon a given scenario using verse 4, but in that moment the wisdom lay in verse 5 and in another situation it's vice versa. That means knowing how to be elusive to others but realistic with yourself. It's like watching someone dribble a ball or boxing. It's easy to describe and show what a step over, side step, crossover or counter punch is. But when you try this against a professional athlete, then you quickly realize it's harder than it looks. So, the same can be said with practicing wisdom. In this, King Solomon was the pro. He was a master at delivering on his thoughts, whether it was a matter of foresight or in reflection. Whether it's street smart or book smart, you just couldn't fool him. He knew where the wisdom was in a situation and how to show or hide it. The most famous example of his wisdom is when two women were squabbling over a child. He decided to play the fool by offering to slice the child up and then give each woman a piece of the child. By pretending not to care for the child and giving this lunatic solution, he knew whoever agreed with him was at fault. And sure enough, it was the jealous riddled woman that agreed with him. Of course, he then gave the baby to the right mother in his final judgment on the matter. This was wisdom upon reflection. He had to find wisdom by looking back at events that already happened. His wisdom by foresight is probably where he really lives up to his name. When his dad, King David, was old and dying, a pretty thing called Abishag was brought to nurse and minister to him. There was nothing sexual in this arrangement. In this moment, Solomon's brother Adonijah began to maneuver for supporters to claim the throne after David. But David had already promised Solomon's mom, Bathsheba, that her son was next in line to become king of Israel. Solomon's mom, Bathsheba, outmaneuvered Adonijah and got King David to anoint Solomon as king while he was still alive. After pleading for his life, the newly crowned King Solomon let Adonijah go back to his house. Sadly, after King David died, Adonijah decided to have another go for the throne. But this time he was even more daring but less apparent in his attempt. He went to Solomon's mom and asked if he could marry the pretty girl, Abishag, who had nursed his dad in his final days. Understandably, Bathsheba saw nothing wrong with his request and escalated it to her son King Solomon. When she told Solomon, the response was epic. And why do you ask Abishag the Shunammite for Adonijah? Ask for him the kingdom also, for he is my elder brother, and on his side are Abiathar the priest and Joab the son of Zeruiah. 2 Kings 22 Oh dear! Big bro had crossed the line, and there was no coming back from this one. God do so to me, and more also if this word does not cost Adonijah his life. That's 2 Kings 23 Adonijah was dead by verse 25. Even today, it's hard to explain how Solomon already knew what his brother was up to with this apparently innocent request. I mean, even his own mother who had seen all sorts of drama in King David's house made nothing out of this request. Yet King Solomon knew this was the second time his brother was trying to take the throne from him. No blatant insight is given into how marrying Abishag was part of a coup plot. This wisdom and foresight by Solomon isn't as cheeky as his judgment on the warring mothers, but it is far more convincing in showing his wisdom to a reader. Now this genius was a gift that was given to him after assuming the throne of Israel. In Solomon's early years, he was highly greeted by God. So while taking a nap in Gideon, God appeared to him in a dream and asked him what he should be given. 
Solomon asked for and was granted wisdom. This would go on to place him as, as the sole ruler in history generally referenced to with this character trait. In the Bible there was Moses the meek, Samson the strong, Thomas the doubtful, Judas Iscariot the betrayer, Jesus the Savior, King Solomon was the wise one. When it comes to rulers, even an atheist would admit no other ruler resembles or is known for the word wisdom better than Solomon. Many say such and such ruler was great or magnificent for a number of leaders in history. But to say the wise, well, that isn't so readily branded to leaders or accepted by academics except when it comes to King Solomon. As mentioned in our coverage of King David's rule, King Solomon was given the honor of building the first temple to God in Jerusalem. So if you're ever lucky enough to go there, just remember King Solomon once stood there. It's strange that King Solomon's temple isn't trumpeted nowadays as one of the wonders of the ancient world when so many ancient civilizations such as the Romans and Babylonians took pride in having conquered Jerusalem. Yet wasn't the prize jewel of Jerusalem the temple? The site of the temple built by King Solomon's remains so holy to Christians, Jews, and Muslims that to this day most geopolitical analysts will concede that any conflict over the site today could easily escalate to a global conflict. But somehow this isn't enough for it to be a wonder of the ancient world. Yeah, hmm, go figure. Moving on, now King Solomon's hold over women is also legendary. He had 700 wives and princesses and 300 concubines. Wow, that child support bill must have been almighty. Unfortunately, as with many men in the Bible including that of his father David, Solomon's story with women would be a source of disappointment for his admirers. He got involved with a lot of foreign women from areas which God had told the Israelites not to mix with. In time, they turned him towards their gods and into a builder of temples for their gods. For this, King Solomon's reign would never be at peace again to his death. God would torment him for the rest of his life by allowing rebellions against him from other nations, including those he married into. To compound his troubles, he also had to deal with a civil war in Israel just like King Saul and his dad. It's amazing to think that none of Israel's best kings could keep the peace. No wonder God told them not to ask for a king. Anyways, Solomon's civil war would be the most divisive of all. Ten of Israel's tribes would be taken away from him, eventually creating the kingdom of Judah within Israel, a split that would divide the Israelites for many years. Jerusalem, however, would remain under his rule. As a show of mercy by God for the sake of his father King David. For all the admiration King Solomon gets due to his wisdom, the Bible is very clear that he did evil in the sight of God as he grew older. In a way it reminds the reader of King Saul, who had then lost favor with God as his reign was coming to an end. After the rebellion, the Bible does not give any detail on how King Solomon spent his last days and whether he made right with God for his transgressions. We must, however, be thankful to him for the words of wisdom he left us in his books and remain aware that whatever faith we see at the Wailing Wall is as a result of him constructing the first temple of God.